The old Jacobite burial ground at Stewartsville, North Carolina, the last resting place for a people who, in their own lifetime, knew little rest. McLarens, McCrays, McDonalds, exiles from their father's land, hearts that once knew the sharp air of the Hebrides, buried in the still heat of the Americas. The legacy of Culloden and the clearances hanging over them even beyond the grave. Few races have exercised such influence on the new worlds of America and Australia as the Scots. Yet it could be argued few have received less credit. And for the sons and daughters of the pioneer settlers from Gaelic Scotland, there is the further ambivalence. If the Scottish contribution has been so often blurred by the British contribution, how can the unique role of the Highland Scots be understood when it is still shrouded in myth, legend and lie within Scotland itself? If the promised land lay beyond the Hebrides, the road, or rather the sea to it, was littered by eviction and oppression, and ultimately by exile, only made tolerable by Kianos, the Gallic yearning for a past which in truth may never have been more than a dream. From the lone shieling on the misty islands, mountains divide us, and the waste of the sea, yet still the blood is strong, the heart is highland, and we in dreams behold the Hebrides. The Hebrides, a scatter of islands on the edge of Europe, are at the center of a language and culture whose sons and daughters, for the main part, now live somewhere else. A sea-washed land of light and shade, myth, mist and magic, few places on earth hold their exiled children in such hopeless thrall as the Gaeltach, the heartland of the Gaelic Scots. As the waves of white-sailed emigrant ships rounded the familiar headlands for the last time, a poet wrote that they resembled white, tearful handkerchiefs waving that final, wrenched goodbye. But it was a farewell that was to be far from final. God has made the Highlander migratory, and the dispersal has been, if I don't sound too arrogant, of benefit to the human race as a whole. I'm very typical of people with names like McKinnon. I've got a very typical accent for people with Highland surnames and Christian names like myself, because we've been dispersed. We are everywhere throughout the world. I'm Scottish, that's, that's the way I see it. I don't see myself as Canadian, I'm Scottish. My parents are, my parents' parents are from there, and uh, it's, it's part of my background. I'm stirred by, uh, by Scotland. I think uh, Scotland it has sent a great many men and women all around the world for the last two or three centuries and they have done remarkable things around the world. And uh, it's marvelous uh, to have that blood in your veins. If ships depart, they also arrive. And it's appropriate that to get to the Hebrides, you must still take a boat.
Tracy Ceres from Fort Worth, Texas, was just one of the half million overseas visitors to the Hebrides last summer. The crossing to sky takes less than five minutes, but for the returning gale, it's a journey that spans the centuries. Tracy's Gallic ancestry, like that of many who come here, is tenuous. But for this Texan law student, it's enough just to feel Highland. The Hebrides are as much an emotional as a physical experience. The very place names as melodious as the songs that praise them. But place names too, that speak of a language and a people as alien now in most of the English-speaking world as they are natural here in the Geltach. The Geltach today is reduced to the far northwest of Scotland and the Hebrides. Skye is the historic seat of Kenneth Nengael, the headship of the Gael, a title synonymous with the name Donald. Armadale Castle, the seat of the High Chiefs of Clan Donald, is now a mouldering memorial to greater days, the ruined symbol of a culture which, too, may be on the verge of extinction. But to understand where you are going, it is sometimes important to remind yourself where you have come from, to distinguish myth from reality, legend from history, the truth from the lie. The flowering of Gallic culture under the Lord lasted 400 years, and its acknowledged leaders were Clan Donald, the brilliant pillars of Green Island. Now returning descendants of Highland Scots can begin to learn about their heritage, thanks largely to the generosity of their dispersed fellow Gaels, who have founded a memorial to the language and culture of Gaeldom, here within that high ruined symbol of the power that once was, Armadale Castle. While it is fitting that the exiled sons of Clan Donald have taken the lead, Armadale is intended as an opportunity for all of Highland stock to discover their identity. For the exile, it's a journey of self-discovery, but one that may yet have come too late to save one of the oldest cultures in Europe. The standing stones of Callanish on the island of Lewis. Here, while the ancient Greeks were wrestling with concepts like democracy, and even older people were already plotting the course of the stars and the influence of the moon. It was a wild land they had chosen to tame, but these early farmers knew the importance of the seasons and how to chart them. Their successors built cairns and brochs for fortification and shelter. They carved their legends with pride on lumps of stone and then disappeared from the face of the earth, as big an enigma as they'd been when they arrived. Their successors, the Celts from Argyll and Ireland, had an altogether higher profile. While the Huns and Vandals were pillaging across Europe, the Irish Celts were illuminating manuscripts 
and translating scrolls. They were the bards and the philosophers, the scribes and the scholars. Celtic art was among the most sought after in Europe. Abbey of Iona, founded by the Celtic princeling Columcilla or Columba. It was Columba, expelled from his native Ireland, who was to graft the culture of the Gael onto this bleak place called Scotland. Columbus' arrival on Iona in 563 heralded the new age of the Gael. A priest and at the same time a warrior, Columba converted the wild Pictish chiefs to Christianity, traveling by sea throughout the islands of the west and then onto the mainland itself. Now Iona has become a center of pilgrimage one of the wonders of the Christian faith, but all faiths and all people of peace are welcome here, some bringing new kinds of worship from the new lands to which their forebears had been dispersed. The street of the dead, the ancient route leading to the burial place of 48 kings of Scotland, four kings of Ireland, and eight kings of Norway. From Iona, the resting place of kings, Columbus monks would eventually travel south to instruct even the pagan English themselves in the word of Christ. But by the 8th century, in common with the other early Celtic churches, Iona was coming under attack from the Vikings. As with Orkney and Shetland, the Vikings were to settle in the Western Isles. And over the next three centuries, a Gallic Nordic aristocracy of independent chieftains emerged. But the supreme material legacy left by the Vikings was transport. The fast, maneuverable vessels that were to win for the gales the mastery of the seas and ultimately the creation of a sea kingdom. The Lordship of the Isles was created when Somerled, the great Gallic chieftain, and later his grandson Thonhol, drove the Vikings from the west. For the next 300 years, Clan Donald, as Lords of the Isles, were to rule a kingdom separate from the mainland. The best people in the round world, their joyousness, their keenness, their effectiveness. Without them is no strength. It is no joy without Clan Donald. A council of the Isles met regularly on the island of Isla. Chieftains under the lordship were democratically elected. The first university in the north was created here in 1200 at Carnish on North Uist, where the sons of the chiefs were sent to learn Latin and law. Poets, musicians and craftsmen all flourished under the lordship, and while little of the work in wood and metal remains, there is a great legacy of Celtic carvings on stone. 
The Lordship also boasted its own clan of physicians, the Beatons, and its lawyers, the Morrisons, whose jurisdiction extended from the Butt of Lewis to the Mull of Kintyre, some 700 miles. But as Clan Donald consolidated its right to Kemmersnagel, the headship of the Gael, its greed for territory led it onto the mainland and the annexing of the great earldom of Ross. Still visible, the remains of the castles and fortresses, the legacy of the growing conflict with the kings of Scotland. Under the lordship, the clan system flourished with its concept of equality, its fair laws, its code of hospitality, and its right to depose a bad chief. It was a model form of government. Hedgeduchus and Oeningthik translates as kinship will withstand the rocks. But when the lordship itself began to disintegrate, that rock of kinship became more like shifting sand. Around 1500, the sea kingdom was overwhelmed by the kings of Scotland, and the language and culture of the Gael began its long decline. I was wondering if by chance you had a room for this evening. Yes, certainly. Just a single room. Yes. Yes, um... we certainly have. Come along in. Okay. We've traveled far today. Oh, very far. Now, would you like some wine with your dinner? Ah, yes, I would. Godfrey James, the eighth Lord uh, MacDonald, can trace his ancestry right back to Somerled. He still lives in Skye, just a few miles from his ancestral home at Armadale. I'll start off with a half bottle. Right, certainly. Um, by the way, are you actually the Lord MacDonald? Yes, I, I am indeed. Well, it's quite an honor to be served by the Lord of the Isles. Well, not at all. We enjoy having you. But the oh, biggest okay. battle the present Lord of the Isles has to fight, as he cheerfully admits, is to earn a living. He's clan chief, but the riches of the Lords of the Isles are long gone. Thank you. Well, you enjoy your dinner now, again okay. your wine. Thank you very much. I am a hotelier in Skye, and I like to think I give the same sort of standard of service to the people that come to my hotel as I do to my clansmen. The extraordinary thing about clanship is it's something that's able to transcend all known boundaries. Um, it transcends boundaries of politics, position, religion, race, distance. It transcends certainly um, whether you're a multimillionaire or whether you're somebody sweeping up the, the rubbish from the gutters. They're all clansmen in my eyes. And the extraordinary thing also about clanship is how it's prevailed through centuries as being totally undemocratic. I'm the chief, whether they like it or not. The bleak, treeless heights of Dramossi Moor outside Inverness the site of the last battle fought on British soil, Culloden. The feudal system of kinship had survived the collapse of the Lordship of the Isles for 250 years. But the defeat of the Highland army under Prince Charles Edward Stuart was to destroy the clans forever. Even before Culloden, the proud Highland chiefs had begun the process of Anglicisation that was eventually to divide them from the clansmen. Culloden and its aftermath only served to hasten the process. Prince Charles Edward was just 24 when he first made landfall on the island of Eriske in the early summer of 1745. His bold plan was to restore the exiled Catholic House of Stuart to the throne of Britain. Within a month, despite the scepticism of the main Highland chiefs, he had raised his father's standard at Glenfinnan. <laughs> This was the high summer of the Prince's ambition, and within a few weeks, Perth had fallen to the Highland Army. By September, he was proclaiming his father king in the capital, Edinburgh. General Sir John Cope's government army was no match for the Highlanders, and at the Battle of Preston Pans, they were totally routed. 
Now at the head of an army of over 5,000 men, Charles headed south. Carlisle fell, followed by Penrith, Lancaster, Preston and Manchester. By the time the Highland army reached Derby, London was in chaos. The shops had closed and there was a run on the bank. But few of the English Catholics joined the Prince's cause. And at Swarkston Bridge, less than 200 miles from London, General Lord George Murray and the Highland chiefs persuaded a sullen Charles to retreat to Scotland. In pursuit, with a huge government army, came the King's third son, William Augustus, Duke of Cumberland. The end came on April the 16th, 1746, on a day of rain with intermittent sleet, when Charles's exhausted Highland army was cut to pieces by a government force twice its size. The battle lasted only an hour. Around 1,200 Highlanders were killed and less than 400 government troops. Culloden is still depicted as a battle between the Scots and the English. More accurately, it was a battle between the Highland, largely Catholic Scots, and a Hanoverian army joined by many lowland Protestant Scots. Brother fought brother, as with the sons of the Chisholm of Strathglass. Clan fought clan, including the Macdonalds, who fought on both sides. More than 50 Campbells were captured, fighting for the prince, although the clan itself was firmly on the government side. Charles escaped from the carnage, leaving Cumberland to write his name in the annals of infamy. Prisoners were butchered with a savagery such as had never before disgraced a British army. To this day, the innocent roadside flower, Sweet William, is known in Scotland as Stinking Billy, after the butcher, William of Cumberland. But what followed was even worse. The Highland chiefs who had fought for Charles were either hanged or exiled, and their estates forfeited. Lovett, the chief of Clan Fraser, who had taken no active part in the battle, became the last peer to be condemned and executed in Britain. A price of £30,000 was put on the prince's head, but with the help of loyal friends, including Flora MacDonald, he evaded the government troops. Disguised as Flora's maid, Betty Burke, he made his escape from the Uists to Skye, and eventually by ship back to France. With the passing of the Disarming Act of 1746, no Highlander was permitted to bear arms, wear tartan, or play the pipes. The hereditary judicial power of the chiefs was stripped from them along with their lands. The chain of events was set in motion that would result in the virtual destruction of the Gallic way of life. Oh,
it's impossible to put a figure on the number of Scots who have emigrated in the years since Culloden. The country's population has always been its greatest export. But in the 200 years between 1750 and 1950, it's estimated that the highlands of Scotland lost more than a quarter of a million people. Many went south to the industrial centres of Glasgow and Edinburgh, but still more went abroad on a succession of emigrant vessels. Some went voluntarily in search of a better life. Others went unwillingly, cursing those who were clearing them from their native land. Landlords, brutes, and human people. Fancy a brute of a man who put a woman with seven of her family out, sitting up against a wall, and nobody was allowed to go near us. He was, people were all warned. Anybody who would help us, they were out too. My father was put in prison for six weeks because he was an agitator. My mother was put out of the house with seven of her family. I was only a baby on the breast. That was in 1886. Sonle mag krechtel, alles te mag krechtel, woori mag krechtel, iain mag krechtel, kalle mag kloot, flori niet kloot, iain mag kloot, joer mag kloot, ander niet kloot. According to the population roll of 1852, more than a hundred crofters lived here in two adjoining villages in Sky, Suishnish and Borrow. They made a living by raising barley and potatoes and grazing some stock on the braes of Painvuya. But in that year, Lord Godfrey William Wentworth MacDonald, fourth Baron of the Isles and great-great-grandfather of the present Lord Godfrey, decided that the land should be given over to sheep grazing. The people had to go. The clearance of Borreraig in 1853 was one of the most ruthless in Highland history. Women and children with their possessions were thrown out in the snow and their doors nailed up. They lived like animals for months in the open before accepting their inevitable exile. I have paid 66 rents to the McDonald's. I am not one farthing in arrears. To be cast out of my house and my home to make way for his sheep is what I never expected. It is breaking my heart. The proud boast that there could be no joy without Clan Donald had never rung more hollow. The link between the chief and his kinsmen never more cruelly undermined. I think it is a very sad thing when an entire people, when an entire way of looking at things disappears, and whether it's the Highlanders, the Gales, or whoever it is, then the whole world, I think, the whole of humanity is impoverished if one dimension of it disappears in that way. There was nothing inevitable about the Highland clearances. The difference here was that people were pushed out in appalling circumstances very often. The people who remained were confined to the worst areas of land. All the best land was given to incoming sheep farmers. And that was the real tragedy. And that was the big, big difference as between the Highlands and other parts of Western Europe. What came clear when you began looking at the Laird's papers themselves is that some Lairds at least, and particularly the ones who tended to save papers, had maintained some kind of concern for their tenantry in the course of the enormous economic and social transformations that were going on in the highlands from the 45 until the end of the 19th century. A hundred years before Bororake, the first highland emigrants were already settling in the Carolinas. After Culloden, the taxman class, for centuries the link between the chief and his tenantry, had quickly recognized that the old order was changing. They were the first to hit the emigrant trail, in these early days, often against their chief's wishes. 
before the end of the Napoleonic Wars, almost all of the lairds in Scotland, and particularly in the Highlands, were not at all enthusiastic about their population leaving for overseas. It was felt that if you were losing people, you were somehow losing a labor force, and you were losing wealth, and this was not in the long run to be good for you. If you're in circumstances where you're being very badly treated, where your land is being taken away from you, and you then decide as a result of this to go overseas, then you may not have been forced in the sense that somebody came along and actually took you by the scruff of the neck and threw you out. But in any other real sense of the word, you have been forced. Its circumstances have been created by other people which have made it virtually essential for you to leave. The Highland chiefs and landlords had discovered who were their true kinsmen. Foremost among them, Hanakurik Vor, the great long-legged Chiviot. What was happening at Borarig in the 1850s was just a chapter in a tragedy that had been unfolding all over the Highlands. Now the broad valley of Strathnever in Sutherland is given over entirely to sheep. The only evidence that people once lived here can be found in the scattered mounds of stones, the graveyards of once populous villages. Sutherland was where the first concerted opposition to the rule of the sheep flared into open rioting. But as the opposition was snuffed out and the crofters decanted to the marginal lands around the coast, Sutherland was seen as a model for the new, improved agricultural methods. When the Yorkshire-born first Duke died in 1833, he owned not only a million acres of Sutherland, almost the whole county, but also the fanciful castle of Dunrobin. His annual income, mostly from his estates in England, was £300,000 a year, a multi-million pound fortune nowadays. The most he ever received in rental from his scattered Sutherland tenants was a mere 15,000 pounds a year. From a financial standpoint, his agricultural improvements had been a great success. The slopes of Sutherland were white with sheep. Yet few of those who had been driven from their homes to make way for the Cheviots could bring themselves to condemn the Duke or his Duchess. Instead, they blamed the Duke's factor, Patrick Seller, and later James Loch, the commissioner of Sutherland Estates. It wasn't until seven years after the Duke's death that a stunned Briton learned what had actually been happening in Sutherland in the name of progress. A local stonemason with a talent for the colourful phrase and anger in his heart found a publisher for his memories of Blina and Lushki, the year of the burnings. His name was Donald MacLeod. And MacLeod was at the township of Baron Loshkin when Patrick Seller and his men arrived on June the 12th, 1814. I was present at the pulling down and burning of the house of Willie Chisholm, in which was lying his wife's mother, an old bedridden woman of nearly 100 years of age. I informed the persons about to set fire to the house of this circumstance and prevailed on them to wait until Mr. Seller came. On his arrival, I told him of the poor old woman being in a condition unfit for removal. He replied, damn her, the old witch, she has lived too long, let her burn. Fire was immediately set to the house, and the blankets in which she was carried were in flames before she could be got out. She died within five days. MacLeod was to give personal testimony to this and other clearances in Strathnever when Cellar was brought to trial in Inverness on a charge of murder. But despite supporting evidence from other crofters, Cellar was unanimously found not guilty. And still the burnings went on. Donald MacLeod and his family were cleared from their own village of Russell. His wife became incurably mad, and the family was forced to flee to Canada. The Sutherland clearances and spasmodic violence continued until the 1840s, by which time it was estimated 
more than 10,000 people had been removed from the county, virtually all overseas. The bard Kenneth Mackenzie was to write, Hemik nuikis luikis schleften, schalutich at heen mogruem. I see the hills, the valleys, and the slopes, but they do not lighten my sorrow. I see the bands departing on the white-sailed ships. I see the gale rising from his door. I see the people going, and there is no love for them in the north. But Donald MacLeod's gloomy memories had somehow touched the conscience of the nation. In 1845, the Times of London carried a report on the clearances. The people now are a thin, meagre, half-starved looking and stunted race. The worst sign they exhibit, however, is their abject apathy. The fact is, they are starved down and kept in such perpetual terror of losing their crofts, their only livelihood, that they are spirit broken and hopeless. In neighbouring Rossshire, cleared crofters were reduced to camping out in the local churchyard. The church itself was kept locked. Behind the church, in the churchyard, a long kind of booth was erected. The roof formed of tarpaulin stretched over poles. The sides closed in with horse cloths, rugs, blankets and plaids. On inquiry, I found that this was the refuge of the Glen Calvey people. A fire was kindled in the churchyard, round which the poor children clustered. Two cradles with infants in them were placed close to the fire and sheltered round by the dejected looking mothers. Contrasted with the gloomy dejection of the grown up and the aged was the perhaps not less melancholy picture of the poor children thoughtlessly playing round the fire, pleased with the novelty of all around them. Before they were herded on board the emigrant ship, some of the crofters scratched their names and poignant last messages on the church windows. The names are still there a mute indictment to landlords who preferred sheep to men. Glen Calvey people, the wicked generation, they wrote, as they huddled in that bare churchyard, awaiting their fate into exile, seeming almost to take the guilt upon themselves. If the soft rock of kinsmanship had crumbled into the cruelty of Glen Calvey and Bororig, then perhaps the greatest tragedy was that the fragile flower which had begun it all on the free white Mahrafayona, the Celtic Christianity of Columba, had been turned over the centuries into the ugly doctrinal thistle of a religion in which guilt had replaced forgiveness, in which fate had replaced freedom, in which the constrictions of Calvinism had replaced the compassion of Christ. Glenn Calvey had shown that as little pity could be expected from the church as from the landlords. Shallow men who are stervous, fake if ne who are slain, can ich country true again, can so at Kesri die. Look around you and see the gentry, with no pity for the poor creatures, with no kindness to their kin. They do not think that you belong to the land. Essayist Dr. Samuel Johnson had visited the Highlands with Boswell 20 years after Culloden. He found that he had already come too late. The clans retain little now of their original character. Their ferocity of temper is softened, their military ardor extinguished, and their reverence for their chiefs abated. It affords a legislator little self-applause to consider that where there was formerly an insurrection, there is now a wilderness. A hundred years later, and a hundred thousand people fewer, the wilderness remained, but by the early 1880s, a change had come in the temper of the people. Their patience, if not their faith, had been stretched too far. Resignation had given way to a smouldering resentment which finally flared into open rebellion. By this time, the tenants were in no doubt as to the true identity of their betrayers. Successive chiefs of Clan Donald had pushed the men of Braes and Skye 
down to the infertile ground along the shore. The clan chiefs claimed the higher, more fertile ground for sheep grazing and then for deer. Now the men of Braes were no longer begging for land. They were demanding it. That demand was to ripple right across Skye, to Glendale and Uig and Kilmuir, then on to other areas, to Lewis, to Uist, to Barra. Fifty constables from Glasgow had been sent to arrest five crofters from Braes, who had driven their cattle onto Lord MacDonald's land. Sorley MacLean, the renowned Gaelic poet, lives at Braes. Several of his ancestors took part in the battle. The police began to retreat towards Portree with their five prisoners. I suppose a fight started properly with sticks and stones and fists. And the police were making a fighting retreat with their prisoners and protecting themselves partly from the volleys of stones by exposing the prisoners. The whole story got wide publicity throughout Britain. The police drew their batons and with injuries roughly equal on both sides, finally made their way with their prisoners to Portree. Helen Vaud, Helen Moyon, Helen Mochrias Molon. Great island, island of my desire. It is not likely that the strife and suffering of Braes will be seen requited. It is not certain that the debts of the Glendale martyr will be seen made good. There is no hope of your townships rising high with gladness and laughter. Pity the eye that sees on the ocean the great dead bird of Scotland. And further land raids took place at Glendale. More warrants were issued, including one for the arrest of the ringleader, John McPherson. In Glendale, there are 500 men prepared for any emergency, the Times reported. The whole island of Skye is in a state of wild excitement. By now, the government had to take action. A gunboat was sent, and after negotiations, McPherson and his co-accused agreed to present themselves for trial in Edinburgh. And events were now beginning to move in Westminster. A fortnight before the so-called Glendale martyrs were jailed, a Royal Commission of Inquiry was set up to look into the Crofters' grievances. This was to become the Napier Commission. It was appropriate that the first sitting of the Commission should be in the old church here at Braes on Skye. Among those who gave evidence was Angus Stewart, the great-granduncle of poet Sorley MacLean. Baron Francis Napier, the chairman of the committee, was himself a border landowner. But showing no fear, Stewart laid the blame squarely on his own laird, the sixth Lord MacDonald. I cannot bear evidence to the distress of my people without bearing evidence to the oppression and high-handedness of the landlord and his factor. It was the first time a crofter had ever publicly accused a landlord. When asked what Lord MacDonald could do to help, Stuart replied, It is easy to answer that. Give us land out of the plenty that is about for cultivation. Give us land at a suitable rent. Moving on from Skye, Lord Napier also heard evidence on the neighbouring island of Razi. After Culloden, Razi supported some 2,000 people. Now there are fewer than 200. When my great-grandfather Charles MacLeod represented the Arnish Crofters at the Napier Commission, he said this island was renowned from ancient times for the rearing of big, able men who, in the olden times, successfully defended their island, their castle was never captured. What is their present state nowadays in 1883? The inhabitants are turned out of their homes and their houses set on fire and packed aboard rotten sailing ships and landed on the other side of the globe among savages. In fact, he said, their state is far worse than the Israelites were under Pharaoh's bondage. Callum MacLeod can still recite the testimony his grandfather gave to the Napier Commission as accurately as the day it was delivered in 1883. 
Callum's cottage here at South Arnish on Razi has become a place of pilgrimage for returning exiles and their descendants. He corresponds with Razi MacLeods all over the world. Callum and his wife are the only people now left in this cleared township. When the white sailed ships took the Razi people away, Callum's forebears refused to go. With that kind of bloodline, he was not going to give in lightly to a local authority which refused to build him an extension of the road to his croft. So over 10 years, Callum painstakingly built his own road, a road capable of taking transport. In the process, he moved 60,000 tons of stone and went through six wheelbarrows and 11 shovels. Oh, hello. How hello. Are you? you must be Callum. Yes. I'm and Tracy. From where? I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. From Texas. Well, it's a long distance from here. Yes, it is indeed. In a sense, Callum has become the keeper of the conscience of the island of Razi. No visitor escapes without a lecture on the deprivations faced by his forebears. The crofter who resided up here, one of them that I remember, an old crofter, he said, when young, you weren't allowed to cut a tree on your land. And the peasants were as numerous as the chaffinches you see about here, the landlord's peasant. You weren't allowed to touch them, or otherwise you would be flung out of the old day. And for many who come here, Callum MacLeod's few miles of narrow road have become a symbol, not only of what can be achieved by people who live in remote places, but of the indomitable spirit of the Highland Gale to survive in his homeland. Well, it was awfully nice to meet well, you. Well, it's been a pleasure. Well, Thank you bye very bye. much for everything. Thanks bye for your bye time. And all the best. Okay, Stay you too. Bye bye. Bye bye. There will return the stock of the tenantry who were driven over the seas, and the gentry will be routed as they, the crofters, were. Deer and sheep will be wheeled away, and the glens will be tilled. There will be a time of sowing and reaping, a time of reward for robbers and the cold, ruined stances of houses will be built on by our kinsmen. The dying prophecy of Madivor, great Mary of the Songs, who foresaw a day that has yet to dawn in the highlands of Scotland. But from 1886, with the passing of Gladstone's Crofting Act, at least tenants could no longer be evicted forcibly. There were even greater emigrations still to come but these were sailed under more subtle and powerful lies, incorporated into words like democracy and choice. Sapped by history and poverty at home, thousands were to receive bright letters from America, written in a strange, faltering foreign language, English, which said that all was well in Carolina or Nova Scotia, and asked if anyone had died back home. For both sides, the pain was so great that all was surface brightness, so that all, or nearly all, was left unsaid. Take me.